C gene is associated with uh, AV canal defects, particularly in the setting of common atrium. Heterotaxy syndromes, too. Uh, there are a number of genes that we won't go through, laterality genes that are associated with uh, heterotaxy syndrome, and this can certainly produce AV canal defects. We usually think of AV canal defects as occurring in sort of three types. One is an ASD primum or partial AV canal, uh, where there's really only a communication uh, at atrial level. And then transitional canals, where uh, there's a small but variable size ventricular septal defect or interventricular communication. Uh, and then complete common AV canal where there's a large uh, interventricular uh, communication associated with this. So this is another left to right shunt lesion predominantly. Uh, there's left to right shunting both at atrial level and uh, ventricular level if there is a ventricular septal defect, which produces a biventricular volume, volume overload because the atrial shunt uh, is associated with right-sided overload and the ventricular shunt with more left-sided, but usually the VSD is pretty large, and so uh, it really does produce biventricular uh, volume overload. Uh, variable pulmonary hypertension, largely depending on how large the ventricular septal defect is. ASD primum or transitional canals are usually associated with essentially normal uh, PA pressure or minimal elevations, whereas complete common AV canal with a large VSD, just like a large ventricular septal defect of other types, is associated with pulmonary hypertension. The difference here is that there is much more frequently uh, AV valve regurgitation as well uh, through either the common valve or the left side of the common valve after closure uh, so that <clears throat> AV valve regurgitation on top of uh, the left to right shunt volume load uh, can uh, make the volume loading even worse. And I think that heart failure in these babies is even a little more prevalent. So the, again, our surgical colleagues have produced a series of definitions of things for us, and uh, we'll uh, look at that. Uh, in this case, an ASD primum or partial AV canal is just a, an AV canal defect with only uh, an ostium primum uh, atrial septal defect. Uh, varying degrees of malformation of the left AV valve, but it's virtually always uh, abnormal uh, in these patients, and varying degrees of AV valve regurgitation, but no ventricular septal defect. So this is um, <clears throat> that kind of uh, defect, a partial AV canal defect that you see here. Here's the uh, rest of the atrial septum seen uh, back here. Uh, this is the uh, AV canal defect, the primum atrial septal defect. Here's the edge of the inner atrial septum here. Uh, these, this is the tricuspid valve, the tongue of AV valve tissue that's covering the crest of muscular septum in this type of defect. Uh, and it's the attachments of, these, uh, AV, of this AV valve tissue onto the crest of the septum that doesn't permit uh, an interventricular communication. Let's see if we can. So <clears throat> here we're opening. Here's the, the area of the fossil valus here. Uh, you can see that there is a, uh, the superior vena cava going up that direction. Uh, here's the coronary sinus uh, right here. Uh, and so this is the area uh, where a secundum atrial septal defect would be, uh, but this is relatively intact. It looks like there may be some sutures there uh, that completely close it. So here's the right ventricle down here. This is the um, <clears throat> crest of the muscular septum. Uh, and so this is the edge of the inner atrial septum. And between here and here is the ostium primum defect. This is the old uh, communication between the two parts of the embryonic uh, atrium. And here you see this tongue of AV valve tissue that stretches out and covers the muscular septum here so that when the AV valves coapt, the coaptation line is in uh, line with the crest of the muscular septum and there's no opportunity uh, for interventricular shunting uh, in this situation. That's the outflow up there going up to the pulmonary valve on the Left side, we see, again, the deficiency of the septum, which is typical of all AV canal defects. There's this sort of scooped out appearance of the uh, inlet ventricular septum. Here's the superior and inferior cushion components of the uh, mitral or left AV valve and the lateral cushion component here. We know that the inferior cushion and superior main cushions are the ones that contribute uh, 
uh, these two valves in the lateral cushion, this one. This is the posterior medial and the anterolateral papillary muscle groups here uh, in the ventricle. And this is the left ventricular outflow tract up to the aortic valve. And there's aortic valve leaflets there. It's only the superior leaflet that's in continuity with the aortic valve. The inferior leaflet isn't. The space here between the superior and inferior cushion components of the left side of the valve is the cleft uh, in the mitral valve. This is the uh, area that is typically sewn together to create uh, not a normal, but at least a more functional anterior mitral leaflet to oppose to the posterior leaflet back here. The other characteristic of AV canal defects is that uh, normally in a normal mitral valve, the anterior leaflet makes up roughly 40% of the circumference uh, of the AV valve, whereas the posterior leaflet makes up about 60% of the circumference. Whereas in AV canal defects, it's almost the opposite. The anterior leaflet has a much, makes up much more of the circumference of the uh, AV valve and the posterior leaflet makes up less. And this is true of mitral valves with clefts most of the time, whether it's an isolated cleft, whether it's a cleft mitral valve in a conotruncal anomaly, or whether it's a common AV canal like this. This is, um, you can see here the dense attachments of the AV valve here onto the crest of the septum. So you can imagine when these leaflets close, uh, there's no opportunity for interventricular communication here because of the, of the density of the attachments. We'll see that the deficiency of the central part of the heart is roughly similar uh, in AV canal defects of all types, whether they're partial AV canal defects like this or complete common AV canal defects. So then a transitional is one with uh, more or less two distinct AV valve orifices uh, with an ASD and a VSD just below the AV valves, a typical uh, VSD, but in the intermediate forms, um, the VSD is often restrictive and often rather small. Now here's a little heart like that. This is a smaller heart. So here we see, again, the fossa back here with the secundum atrial septal defect, the coronary sinus down here. Here's the edge of the inner atrial septum here, the primum defect down there. Superior vena cava would be uh, up in this direction here, and here's the uh, atrial appendage here. As we look down into this, you can see the other parts of the atrial appendage, the coronary sinus, and here's the free edge uh, of the inner atrial septum, that being the primum defect down here. Now, when we look in the ventricle, here's the outflow up here. Here's the anterior um, leaflet up here. It's really the septal leaflet that is mostly influenced by the uh, AV canal defect. Here you can see the outflow is unobstructed up here. Here's the uh, flow through the valve. And on the left side, again, we see the inferior and superior cushion components of the left AV valve, the superior going to the anterolateral, the inferior to the posterior medial only, and the lateral leaflet going in between. But here what we see are little interstitial spaces here uh, between the attachments of the AV valve onto the crest of the septum. And even after the AV valve closes, you can imagine that these little spaces afford the opportunity for some interventricular shunting. Uh, and that's what happens. It's really the density of the attachments of the AV valves onto the crest of the septum that determine the size of the ventricular septal defect. Here if we look, the scooped out septum here is roughly the same as what we saw in, in the other heart. This part of the inlet septum that's missing back here is roughly the same. The difference is that we don't have the tongue of AV valve tissue uh, running on the crest of the septum here that prevents interventricular communication. We have uh, more sparse attachments and some length to the chordae here so that it's possible to have little VSDs in between the intercordal spaces. And then a complete common AV canal is one where there's generally a common orifice, uh, as we'll see, uh, and uh, there's an interatrial communication as well as generally a minimally or non-restrictive uh, ventricular septal defect below uh, the plane of closure of the uh, AV valves. And so this is uh, an example of that. This is here you can see uh, from the left ventricular side here. I can get this to work. Yeah, there we go. From the left ventricular side, um, <clears throat> here you can see the superior leaflet up here. Uh, 
attached onto the septum. Here's the inferior leaflet down here with attachments onto the crest of the septum. And you see how long these cordae are and how sparse the attachments are. So this allows for a large uh, interventricular communication. This is the posterior medial papillary muscle here. The anterolateral papillary muscle is up here. Uh, and again, you can see the sparse attachments here so that uh, there's an opportunity for a large uh, interventricular communication in this uh, arrangement of the AV valves. From the right side, here you can see the edge of the interatrial septum. This is the superior leaflet there. The inferior leaflet down here, here's the anterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve over here. Here's superior and inferior cushion components of the uh, common AV valve. This is the atrium back here with coronary sinus and the fossa. And here's the edge <clears throat> of the interatrial septum. And again, this is the division between the superior and inferior uh, cushion components of the common AV valve with the anterior leaflet up here. Embryologically, it's the septal leaflet that comes from the two primary cushions, <clears throat> whereas the anterior and inferior leaflets come from the lateral cushion uh, in the right side. So that it's really the septal leaflet uh, of the tricuspid valve that has a division in it when there's a complete common AV canal defect. And here's, um, that was a, actually a, a type A, let me just show you. <clears throat> because the superior leaflet here is uh, divided and attached onto the crest of the interventricular septum here, whereas in the next one I'll show you, uh, we don't have that. This is a, uh, one where there's a free-floating superior leaflet. So here's just the front of the heart, the pulmonary artery, aorta, here, aorta. PA, normally related great arteries. And then <clears throat> opening the right atrium, again, you see the fossa, superior vena cava. Here's the fossa. And here's the free edge uh, of the atrial septum here. The canal defect is below that into the ventricle, and there's uh, superior vena cava there. Now, if we open the right ventricle in this patient, you'll see that uh, the superior leaflet up here is not attached onto the crest of the septum. It extends freely across into the left ventricle on, on the other side, and on, there's the inferior leaflet there. And here you can see that this is attached. Uh, the, inferior, the superior leaflet comes across and is attached onto a paraseptal papillary muscle here, a big papillary muscle here in the right ventricle. Instead of coming over all the way to the free wall, this is... Um, uh, one of the other arrangements, uh, Ristelli called this a type B uh, AV canal, where there's a big paraseptal uh, muscle bundle in the right ventricle that receives the attachments. And then on the left side, again, you see the crest of the septum here, inferior leaflet. There's the smooth part of the interventricular septum. The more trabeculated part down here, typical of a left ventricle. This is the superior uh, cushion or superior leaflet, inferior leaflet here. You can see there's a lateral leaflet there on the free wall uh, but that runs between the two papillary muscles. <clears throat> in this case, the superior leaflet, again, attaches only to the anterolateral, the inferior leaflet only to the posterior medial. And again, the cleft is between the two uh, leaflets, the two parts of the AV valve. The superior leaflet is in continuity with the aortic valve here and not the inferior leaflet. And here you can see that the superior leaflet continues across into the right ventricle. There are no attachments onto the interventricular septum up here. So this is a free-floating anterior leaflet that ends up uh, crossing. And this, this is just the fossa in the left ventricle, uh, septum primum here and septum secundum, and the free edge of the atrial septum uh, back here with pulmonary veins coming into the left atrium. And this is, uh, I think, a type C. And now, again, you see the uh, outside the front of the heart here, the pulmonary artery and aorta. And the atrial appendage here, the right atrial appendage opening the right atrium. We see there's a secundum atrial septal defect in this patient as well. You can see septum primum is deficient here. Septum secundum is up here. So this patient has both types of atrial septal defect, a secundum type as well as the primum defect down here. 
And here you see again the free edge of the atrial septum uh, <clears throat> sitting above uh, the two parts, the two leaflets uh, of the AV valve. Coronary sinus is down here. So here again is this free floating superior leaflet that extends over all the way into the left ventricle there in the outflow tract. Uh, is up here. Pulmonary valve there. And in the left side, and you see the inferior leaflet here, superior leaflet here, and the large lateral leaflet in this case, well-spaced papillary muscles uh, within the left ventricle. Superior leaflet, aortic valve, inferior leaflet here inferior leaflet to the posterior medial, anterolateral here with just the superior leaflet. And again, you see this free-floating leaflet here that's continuous all the way across. Instead of being divided here with attachments onto the crest of the septum, this extends all the way across into the left ventricle over to the free wall of the, of the right ventricular cavity. And that's just, again, showing the edge of the septum and the secundum defect from the left atrial aspect with the left atrial appendage there. So canals can be uh, unbalanced. This is uh, an example of uh, an unbalanced AV canal here. We're looking at this from above. You can see that in this case you see the orifice of the common AV valve here that goes all the way around so that there's a common orifice to the valve. This is the uh, edge of the atrial septum. Uh, and so this, the, the orifice into the valve is undivided, sort of like the waist of a pair of pants. Uh, and then it, here you see the plane of the interventricular septum with the superior leaflet and the inferior bridging leaflet here. This is the right ventricular uh, orifice and the left ventricular orifice. So this is unbalanced, favoring the left ventricle with the smaller uh, right ventricular orifice on this side. And there's the plane of the uh, interventricular septum uh, down here, but you, you get the idea of how this is like, um, uh, a, and here's this, this bridging leaflet again going across. This is a common superior bridging leaflet that goes all the way uh, across from one ventricle to the other, the inferior leaflet there, and the outflow up here. Notice that this right ventricle is a little bit small. Uh, you can see it really doesn't make it quite to the apex of the heart, and it's not nearly as big uh, as the left ventricle on the other side. Uh, most of the AV valve is here centered over the left ventricle with the uh, lateral superior and inferior uh, leaflets of the valve here. So this is unbalanced uh, favoring the left side. You can also have uh, unbalanced canals favoring the right side. It's possible, for example, here's a, uh, a canal that's unbalanced favoring the right side. Here you can see a large uh, RV orifice, a small LV orifice. Uh, and surgically, it's possible to repair this in such a way that you can enlarge the left side of the AV valve. This was the pre-op, and this is the post-op size of the left AV valve. So um, <clears throat> particularly when it's unbalanced favoring the RV, it's possible to steal a little bit of the AV valve uh, and repair uh, this as a two-ventricular repair. It's a little bit harder uh, when it's unbalanced in the other direction. So <clears throat> I think we'll stop at this point. The, Generally, the management uh, for these, uh, for an ASD primum, is just surgical closure, usually in early uh, childhood, uh, since there's uh, no uh, interventricular communication here. Uh, the main risk here, of course, is mitral insufficiency uh, after repair. Um, <clears throat> and then for complete common AV canal, surgical repair early uh, in infancy, usually between two and four months because of uh, the risk of pulmonary vascular disease is much higher in patients with uh, AV canal, particularly if they have Down syndrome. Uh, and rarely it can, the AV valve is unbalanced enough um, and one of the ventricles is small enough that the only real option uh, is a, a Fontan type of uh, approach. So now I think what Dr. Rudolph? Yeah.
it vertically. She must have taken it. Okay. Check cell spreadsheet. Okay, good. Well, I'm not going to spend much time on this because Dr. Sanders has really uh, mentioned all these things. The only couple of points I want to mention are that in the complete uh, atrioventricular septal defect or atrioventricular canal, there is a common annulus for the mitral and tricuspid valves. They're not two separate an uh, annually. Can you speak up a bit, please? Okay. Um, and uh, usually both the mitral and tricuspid valves are deficient. Now, the question is, what is the shunting pattern in atrioventricular septal defect? We know that when there is a atri separate atrial septal defect or separate ventricular septal defect, the shunting is determined largely by what happens to pulmonary vascular resistance. We've talked about that with both lesions. So uh, the, the shunting is dependent then. We call it dependent on pulmonary vascular resistance. Now, when there's a complete atrioventricular septal defect, there's often deficiency in function of the mitral valve. This allows blood to be ejected from the left ventricle through the mitral valve and then across the atrial septal defect. This defect allows shunting then from a high pressure to a low pressure chamber. And the, this type of shunt is not dependent on pulmonary vascular changes. And it can occur even when pulmonary vascular resistance is high and does not fall. So it becomes quite important because it's possible then with this type of shunting that it occurs even when pulmonary vascular resistance hasn't fallen. And the importance of it is that it provides an enormous increase in flow into the pulmonary system, even when pressure is high. So that when we talk about a dependent shunt, we're talking about a shunt from LA to RA or LA to RV. An obligatory shunt is essentially that type of shunting. Now, the presence of the abnormal mitral valve leads to, the, you would believe, that this must result in mitral insufficiency. The problem is that there is not a good relationship between what you see in terms of the way the mitral valve looks and the way it actually functions. So that in, in, many, in, in most instances actually, when you have a mitral valve cleft in the early stages of development in the fetus and newborn period, there is not much mitral insufficiency usually. There can be, but there isn't. And the reason is that when the ventricle is small, this valve functions reasonably efficiently. When the ventricle enlarges and there is a separation of these two components of the valve, then insufficiency can be developed. That is why it's not common to see insufficiency early on during development, but as the child or adult gets bigger, just growth of the ventricle can result in insufficiency of that valve. And certainly enlargement of the ventricle will result in, can result in inefficiency of the, the valve. Now, a tricuspid valve insufficiency, the same principles apply. Usually it's not very uh, evident 
in the early stages, and it's only when the heart gets much bigger that this begins to appear. Now, what is the effect of an atrioventricular septal defect in the fetus? Well, when you look at, we know, as I mentioned earlier today, in the normal fetus, the blood from the ductus venosus and the um, left hepatic vein stream preferentially through the foramen into the left atrium. So, and that provides the higher oxygen saturation in left atrial, left ventricular, and ascending aortic blood. But when there is no normal foramen of Valley, this preferential streaming pattern is interfered with. And blood may therefore go both, this oxygenated blood may therefore go into both right and left atrium, and therefore the normal. Uh, differential saturations between ascending and descending aorta will not be present. Now, in addition, because some of this oxygenated blood gets into the right side of the heart, the saturation, oxygen saturation of blood being delivered to the pulmonary circulation is somewhat higher. And this could affect pulmonary vascular resistance because we know that the pulmonary vascular, uh, vasculature in the fetus is exquisitely sensitive to changes in oxygenation so that it's possible that pulmonary vascular resistance may be lower in these fetuses than in the normal. Now, <coughs> with uh, the partial atrioventricular septal defect, uh, there's no significant change in the shunting patterns in the atria. That's in the uh, Austrian premium defect. And just, as I mentioned, despite the presence of the cleft, there's no functional mitral regurgitation. With a complete defect in the fetus, again, I mentioned regurgitation through the AV valve is insignificant. There would be minor degrees of left to right or bidirectional shunting through the ventricular septal defect as occurs normally in the ventricular septal defect. Um, it's quite unusual that the mitral valve is very insufficient in the fetus. It does occur. When it does occur, it imposes a tremendous problem to the fetus because that involves creating a large volume load. As I mentioned, it's not dependent, even though pulmonary vascular resistance remains high in the fetus, this type of shunting results in a large volume load, which results in both a pressure and volume load on the right side, results in an increase in venous pressure. And these are the fetuses with this type of situation who develop high drops. It's uncommon, but it does occur. Now, what happens after birth? Well, with the osteum premium defect, it's not very different from what happens with an the osteum secundum atrial de defect, because as I mentioned, there's usually very little mitral insufficiency in the early postnatal period, so that these patients behave very much like ordinary atrial septal defect. Um, pulmonary vascular resistance increase may occur, usually after 20 to 30 years. Now, if there's in a complete atrioventricular septal defect where there's both an atrial and ventricular communication and mitral valve insufficiency, when there's, in the early stages of development, when there's mild or no mitral valve, AV valve insufficiency, these, and incidentally, Down syndrome patients characteristically don't have much in the way of uh, valvular insufficiency. But 
when the VSD is large, these patients behave as if they have a VSD, a, a big VSD, just the same as we just talked about with the VSD. And with a fall in pulmonary vascular resistance after birth, uh, both atrial and ventricular shunts increase. Um, the left ventricular end diastolic pressure and left atrial <coughs> pressures increase, and the left ventricular output increases. <coughs> and if the shunt is large, they may go into failure. The combined ventricular and atrial left to right shunts create a very large volume load on the left and right ventricles and therefore failure is very common. Now, in infants born at high altitude and infants who have lung disease, such as it's common in Down syndrome patients, the ventricular and, vent and atrial components of the shunt are much less because of the fact that pulmonary vascular resistance is maintained at a high level, and these patients do not develop failure. So Down syndrome patients, characteristically, it's unusual for them to develop failure in early infancy. <coughs> now, if, if there's severe insufficiency, as I mentioned, and as I said, this is not common in Downs. Uh, while pulmonary va vascular resistance is still high, these patients will still have a large shunt. Now, it's interesting that in these individuals, where they do develop a uh, large obligatory shunt, the pulmonary flow becomes very high and pulmonary arterial pressure stays very high. In fact, pulmonary arterial pressure becomes so high that it may create a right to left shunt through the ductus. While the ductus is still open, many of these patients with um, complete AV canal with, minor, with obligatory shunt develop a uh, ductus right to left shunt because the and the pulmonary vascular resistance tends to stay very high in these individuals because of the high flow and high, high flow into the pulmonary circulation and the high pulmonary arterial pressure. And therefore, pulmonary vascular resistance stays up. It doesn't fall as it does in the normal. Now, as I mentioned, the mitral valve insufficiency may not be severe early on, may be quite mild, but as pulmonary vascular resistance falls and the dependent left to right shunt increases, the ventricle may enlarge because of the large volume returning to it, and this may aggravate the mitral insufficiency, which then becomes manifest. So I think the point I, I want to impress on you about this is that there is a real uh, discrepancy between what you see pathologically and what you see functionally in these patients. And although it seems as if they should have very poor valve function, when they are young and certainly in fetal life, the valve is pretty normal in function. So that the development of valve abnormality comes later in life with growth of the ventricle either by normal growth or by a failure with, due to shunt. Thank you.
repeat what everybody else has said. There's nothing like repetition for education. So um, we'll skip the first slide. I've allotted myself 25 minutes. I'll be lucky to finish in time. So um, these are three pictures from Larson, uh, the embryology, and I'll just direct your attention not to the looping at this point, but what happens in the formation of the atrial septum in the fetal life. It grows down from above and joins with the endocardial cushions. Then the septum secundum forms on the right side from the left venous valve of the sinus venosus. Um, and basically that's how the osteum primum defect starts. In fact, the osteum primum defect is right there. So the defect is uh, a defect of the junction of the uh, septum primum with the endocardial cushion tissue. And the other part of the uh, uh, um, story is uh, how the AV valve starts on the, uh, as a common AV valve on the left side of the circulation here. And the canal shifts, uh, uh, unfortunately this is a cartoon so only one thing happens, and as it shifts it divides into two separate orifices, the one committed to the left side and the other one committed to the right side. So just let's keep this in mind about the development of the AV canal and the last part of the story in embryology very simply, uh, also from Larson's uh, embryology, you can get this on the web if you like it, is, um, is the spiral septum which comes down and divides the septum so that the left component goes posteriorly and then spirals anteriorly and the right component comes anteriorly and spirals to the back. So that's quickly the whole story. Now, echocardiographically we like to look at the AV junction and here is an AV junction as seen from above as Dr. Shirali would like to show it to us with the aortic root wedged firmly between from above the mitral and the tricuspid valve. In an AV septal defect, because the canal doesn't separate, here's the canal, here's the uh, coronary sinus going to the uh, right side here, um, to the left, to the right side here, uh, you see um, that the uh, aortic root doesn't descend into the um, AV junction separating the valve. So it's sort of sprung out of the canal. And here is the antero superior bridging leaflet, the mural leaflet, um, I beg your pardon, that's a tricuspid. The mural leaflet is here, the antero superior and posterior inferior bridging leaflets here. And people often call this a mitral valve, but it really doesn't look anything like a mitral valve. In fact, Alain Carpentier said it looks much more like a tricuspid valve with one, two, and three cusps on it. So let's just look at some of the things that we described about the AV canal, and that's the gooseneck deformity that Dr. Sanders talked about as well with an elongation of the outlet. It's elongated because the uh, root doesn't descend between the cushions and also that there's some erosion of the inlet. So there's inlet, outlet disproportion in an AV canal. And here's a normal heart here. And here is what you see in an AV canal defect. So instead of this being a one-to-one -one relationship, it's uh, more like a, a two-to-one relationship. And that's very important because the junction is always common in an AV canal, regardless of whether it's an osteum premium defect or a complete canal. But uh, there are some other things that occur because of this. The, uh, because the outlet septum is long and elongated, there's sometimes the development of outlet obstruction here. And when we look at um, the normal heart on an echo, you can see the aorta and uh, relationship to the left ventricle. But when you have an AV canal, you see the gooseneck deformity, which you'll see over here, and I'll show you uh, when we put this on, there's the inlet outlet disproportion on a specimen. And here is the so-called gooseneck deformity, which I've indicated here by means of a drawing on the echocardiogram, and which is really quite characteristic on the cineangiogram. And the reason is not the displacement of the AV valve, but rather the difference in the disparity between the lengths of the various parts of the septum. 
And just incidentally, as we know about the conducting tissue, the conducting tissue has got to come posteriorly in this condition. And so the left fascicle comes over here, and then the anterior fascicle goes up anteriorly over a long distance, and that gives rise to the so-called left anterior hemiblock pattern that is characteristic of AV septal defects. Now, when we look in the, at cross-section of the mitral valve, here's an example of an isolated left, uh, a cleft in the left AV valve, and as Dr. Sanders so beautifully defined, in the normal mitral valve, the mural leaflet of the mitral valve occupies I think he said 60%, I say two-thirds, and the anterior leaflet one-third. The depth of the anterior leaflet is two-thirds to one-third of the posterior leaflet. So the circumference is made up largely of this condition. And as papillary muscles support commissures, when you get a complete AV canal, the AV valve leaflet, uh, the papillary muscles which support the commissures are rotated round the posterior much more than the anterior and then of course the mural leaflet is small and I think this is an important point to look at with our surgical colleagues because um, that is one of the critical factors about how these conditions need to be repaired and certainly from my point of view my perspective is I really need to provide the surgeons with the appropriate information so that all they need to do is go ahead and repair the defect. So here's an isolated cleft in the mitral valve and you can see in this patient the papillary muscles are in the normal position and this is an AV canal defect, um, one of my patients, so I can validate that it is an AV canal defect and you see the leaflets are rotated around, there isn't that much uh, difference in the uh, anterior and posterior leaflet uh, uh, papillary muscle but uh, certainly when you look at the cleft it creates a left, uh, a, a, a cleft or so-called cleft which is nothing more than the commissure of those two bridging leaflets that we saw the anterior superior and posterior inferior bridging leaflet and the mural leaflet posteriorly. And if you didn't like that picture again I can show this to you from a number of different points of view and of course here we see the papillary muscles are closely spaced and the mural leaflet is really quite small. In some cases it's larger than in others and in some patients with AV septal defects or AV canal defects these leaflets get so close together that it may look just like a parachute mitral valve and then of course you have to leave the cleft open as a surgeon otherwise you have a parachute mitral valve with mitral stenosis. So Giancarlo Rustelli did a great job for us by dividing AV septal defects into type A with a caudal attachment to the crest of the septum, type B as Dr. Sanders showed you with the papillary muscle lying within the right ventricle, this is from the back forward, so this is right atrial appendage, this is left atrial appendage, okay, so right atrial, left atrial component, here the leaflet is straddling across and unattached to the crest of the septum, here it's attached to the crest of the septum, here it's attached to a right ventricular papillary muscle, quite rare when we see them echocardiographically, and of course these are twisted round, and type C, which is the most primitive variety where the, uh, papri, where the valve extends from a papillary muscle in its usual position in the right ventricle to the papillary muscle in the left ventricle, and this is the anterior superior bridging leaflet, uh, as you see it here, also from the back and echocardiographically you can identify this, that there are cordy tendony going to papillary muscles, but nothing attached to the crest of the septum. So, just in recapitulation, uh, this is a normal, uh, con uh, my concept of what the AV valve looks like. The aorta is wedged between the mitral and the tricuspid valve. Here we're looking from below upwards. And here are the papillary muscles. Because the papillary muscles support commissures and these are rotated round, uh, you see the papillary muscles are rotated from their normal position and uh, the aortic root is unwedged. Shunting can occur either at atrial level as we've seen or at both levels as you see in a partial or a complete uh, AV def uh, defect and also the VSD of the AV canal type where it only occurs at, at a ventricular level. And when we look at the Rostelli classification, we can look at the anterior papillary muscle and see this papillary muscle here attached to the crest of the septum, here lying within the ventricular septum, 
and here fused with the lateral anterior papillary muscle, giving rise to the characteristic component of the AV valve. Here, attached to the crest of the septum, here are a papillary muscle within the right ventricle, and here straddling completely. And we can see this echocardiographically, and I've cut two hearts for you to show you this. Uh, this is a type A of uh, Rustelli here, where the cords are attached to the crest of the septum. And this is a subcostal oblique view. You can see the aorta here. You can see left ventricle and right ventricle here. Here's the crest of the septum. Here's the out outlet ridge here. This is the anterior bridging leaflet, which is clearly attached to the crest of the septum. The mural leaflet, Rastelli said, is not terribly important uh, because they all look the same. They all attach to the crest of the septum. And I'll show you something about that because uh, in terms of AV canal defects, all we're looking at is acquired embryology. And here's a type C of Rastelli where the leaflet is not attached to the crest of the septum. And here you can see uh, the anterior superior leaflet is unattached here arising from papillary muscles, anterior papillary muscle in the right and the left ventricle. So our goals in ultrasound are to define the extent of the atrial communication, the type and extent of the ventricular communication, to demonstrate valve morphology, attachment and function, uh, display the shunting patterns and the magnitude of the shunt, the type of AV valve regurgitation, magnitude, position and direction, assess the commitment of the atrioventricular junction to the underlying ventricular mass, which is called balance, and the size of the underlying ventricle, which is a part of the whole thing, and recognize associated defects and after that, a prayer. So when, having told you that Rastelli is very easy, I can tell you now that the surgeons care very little about Rastelli because in the early days, what the surgeons were worried about was whether they would have to divide the valve and use a single patch or whether they would put in two separate patches. And obviously the type C canal defect is much more difficult to repair than the type A. And so in the early days, that was a problem. But I think modern surgical techniques have taken care of that. And then it's a surgical choice, matter of choice, whether you either split the valve or you split the patches. But if you consider a hole in the middle of the heart that you have to put a cross through, you've got to do one or the other. Either split the valve, some surgeons prefer to split the valve, and others just prefer to split the patch. And there's merit to both of those examples. But again, i just show you this that you can see very beautifully here, the attachment to the uh, anterior superior bridging leaflet. Not only that, but you can see the papillary muscles lying within the left ventricle, and you can see the small circumferential nature of the uh, mural leaflet of the valve over there and its attachments all the way around. Here's a Rastelli type C, and one of the secrets about Rastelli type C, although it exists, if ever you see a conotruncal defect, they almost all Rastelli type C canals. This is a patient with a tet tetralogy as well as an AV canal, and here you can see the bridging leaflet is unattached to the crest of the septum above. The posterior leaflet is attached to the crest of the septum, and um, you can see this one as a common valve rising between the two. So we can do that regularly for the surgeons. The reasons why I don't have lots of pictures of uh, type B is because I think it's exceedingly rare. Okay. Now, what about AV valve regurgitation? Dr. Rudolph has spent a lot of time talking about it. And, uh, you know, I sort of grew up with the idea of this obligatory shunting. But I'd like to introduce perhaps another little concept to you related to what Doppler has given us as a, a technique for this. Now, we, there's a condition called entrainment. And entrainment is used in electrophysiology where you uh, put a rate in and you can capture a pacemaker to this various rate. But in terms of Doppler fluid dynamics, entrainment is what happens when you get um, a jet going in one direction and the mass of blood attracted to it. And let me put it to you that in this patient with an AV canal defect, both at atrial and ventricular levels, there is some regurgitation through the left component of the AV valve here. But please remember also that there is a very, very large atrial defect in uh, 
left to right at this level occurring in this patient. And so the jet that probably would be directed towards the AV valve here is also in some way from one reason or another entrained by this um, uh, left to right shunt to go from the left ventricle and to the right atrium. So there's another reason why you get entrainment of this condition. And in fact, the interesting thing is if you look at the fetus where the shunt at atrial level is from right to left rather than from left to right. Sometimes the central jet seems to go more preferentially to the left atrium than the right atrium. And I'd love to hear Dr. Rudolph's comments about that during the discussion section. Okay, so these are the shunts that we see. A secundum, a premium ASD, ventricular defects, and three jets at, uh, through the AV valve. Now, that's the most critical thing. And here's another patient which has three jets. And I think that's very important in terms of knowing where the jets are in terms of where the deficiency is. Now, our colleague who's not here, Dr. Jeff Smallhorn, has done some absolutely stellar work using three-dimensional echocardiography with uh, color Doppler. In fact, the work in Toronto, they used to call Jeff's work 3D echo, but it said three-day echo because that's how long it took him to generate the information uh, that uh, he was giving. But I think that we can get from a 2D echo a number of important issues. This jet over here is a lateral jet, and that jet comes probably from the junction of the mural leaflet with the posterior bridging leaflet. Okay, and the surgeon has to know about that because not that they really pay a lot of attention to what we do because they float the valve up uh, with water when they're looking at the valve to see how to repair it. But this defect is not a defect related to the cleft. The defect related to the cleft is the central left jet here. It doesn't look like it's left, but you'll see it is. And then, of course, there is a right AV valve uh, uh, component jet in this direction. So let's just put this into play there and you can see that uh, particular pattern there and in fact all the shunts appear to land up uh, in the right atrium in this patient as they do in a lot of patients. Now um, so here's another example of a left ventricular to right atrial shunt that you can see very clearly and again uh, we have to evoke this problem. Here's the uh, atrial flow coming from the pulmonary veins towards the atrial septum here doesn't seem to be a very big ventricular component here. And this jet is in training this and taking it once the jet goes towards the right ventricle, it goes there. Now, for whatever reason, uh, that um, uh, is uh, a, um, uh, uh, once the jet is there, the volume and whatever is going to go onto the right side of the heart. And perhaps uh, also, Dr. Rudolph, one might want to reflect at why in some patients in whom they banded the pulmonary artery, some of the patients did better. And I think maybe they did better because they raised right ventricular pressures uh, and then they um, don't shunt so much left to right at atrial level. Um, and here is a complete AV canal with, uh, again, defects. And you can see... Uh, in this patient over here, the lateral jet going back into the atrium as well as the left ventricular to right atrial shunt uh, jet here, which I think we can define very nicely with Doppler color flow. Here's a patient who, who had also a jet in utero from right to left, and uh, this patient indeed was found to have sub profound left ventricular outflow tract obstruction related to the deformity of the outflow tract uh, that here's the aortic valve, and you can see only about a two millimeter left ventricular outflow tract in this patient. And this patient actually landed up getting a Norwood procedure. You can see the acceleration of here with very little flow going out the aorta, uh, and uh, uh, in fact, actually succumbed. Well, in addition to all of those things, of course, uh, one of the com most complex conditions we can get is uh, AV canal with, uh, with uh, heterotaxy. And here's a patient with right isomerism and heterotaxy. And uh, these patients have very primitive AV canal defects, uh, usually with a lot of atrioventricular valve regurgitation. But I bring this to you, just show you that uh, we have to be cognizant of the whole pattern of uh, the echocardiogram in making an assessment of uh, AV valve uh, lesions, and it's a dominant, right dominant 
uh, valve as well. Now, uh, we mentioned that the papillary muscle, uh, when they get very close together, can almost look like a parachute mitral valve. And indeed, this is a patient where um, the papillary muscles are so close that the rest of the valve physiologically appear to be similar to a parachute mitral valve. Uh, this is an illuminated specimen. Uh, this is one of our patients that also had um, Schoen's complex and had um, an aortic valve replacement, multiple uh, false tendons across the left ventricular outflow tract, and a classical parachute mitral valve. And indeed, it occurs in AV septal defects or AV canal defects as well. Um, I mentioned this to you before. This is a patient with a VSD of the AV canal uh, type, a very large defect, a ostium secundum defect, but no ostium primum defect. And here is the surgical repair where uh, the buttressing uh, the um, uh, margin of the ventricular septal defect and looking to see also the uh, so-called uh, cleft in the left component of the AV valve. Now, um, AV, valve, AV septal defects occur with tetralogy of Fallot, uh, particularly in Down syndrome. Uh, here is a heart where we're looking at a patient uh, who has an ostium secundum defect here, IVC here. Here's the bridging leaflet we're looking from the right side. You see the AV canal here. And when we look from the left side, we can see the aorta overriding the ventricular septal defect and the cleft valve here. And now we'll look at the various specimens. So when you look at the inlet, here's the left component of the valve. Here's the cords going through the ventricular septal defect, a type C of Rostelli. And when you look at the outlet, you have the classical appearance of tetralogy of Fallot amongst the outlet specimen in this heart. So inlet here and AV canal and so on. Now, what about dominance? Uh, to some extent, because of the right ventricular enlargement uh, that occurs early, most AV canals have a little bit of right dominance. But uh, after a while, it gets to be more than just a little bit of dominance. And here is an example of a right dominant AV canal with a large part of the AV valve component lying over the uh, ventricular septum and with a substantial amount of AV valve regurgitation on the right side. And you see how small the left atrium and left ventricle are. I mean, this is clearly going down a one ventricle uh, path uh, for repair. And here's uh, another uh, example showing the dominance with the whole valve almost existing over the, the right ventricle, a very small hyperplastic left ventricle and also a small hyperplastic left atrium. A left dominant AV canals, uh, a little different here. The canal is situated largely over the left ventricle. The right ventricle in this association is often hypoplastic and uh, may have a small right ventricle. And here's one example of a patient who underwent a, a, a different procedure and developed a pericardial effusion, but I think you can see here is the whole um, AV canal lying over uh, the left ventricle, the very small hyperplastic right ventricle um, uh, um, and small component of the valve lying over the morphologically right ventricle. Uh, here's another example of right dominance. Uh, this is a patient with uh, isomerism of the atrial appendages. And uh, you can see here again, a small left ventricle with override. Here's the ventricular septum. There's a left superior vena cava coronary sinus. There's an ostium secundum ASD, and there's a small ventricular component. And I always put this in for the surgeons. This is to uh, show them where to put their sutures uh, in, in the heart. Uh, when you look at this uh, heart from the apex, you can see the whole AV valve uh, uh, overriding the ventricular septum. Uh, the uh, left ventricle is kind of small. And this patient landed up getting a single ventricle repair. The other reasons why the valve may be small, here's a patient with quarter atriotum. So we really have to look all the way through this. You can see the jet coming through this uh, 
quarter atriatum laterally over here with a velocity gradient of nearly two meters per second recorded across there. Now, um, when you look at, um, at dominance, we also look at the AV valve, and uh, this actually is not a patient with a hyperplastic um, or left dominant canal. It's a normal a patient with normal ventricles with total anomalous pulmonary venous return before and after surgical repair. And what we noted when we looked at this initially was that the septum was planed backwards and the left ventricle appeared hyperplastic. And we made some measurements of this and showed that, in fact, if you take an angle over here and you calculate it, you can almost get to understand if the septum occupies a normal uh, position, which it may also in the repair of an AV uh, canal defect, is that um, the dominance are, are in the right side is not that profound. And we did a whole series of measurements uh, in this area, and we found, indeed, that we calculated a reasonable um, uh, estimate of the ventricle, but that we underestimated because what we didn't include was a change in the long axis length, which obviously occurs because ventricles, when they enlarge, they don't just enlarge in one direction, they derage, enlarge in all directions, and our model really didn't take this into account. And so here you see the answer uh, that we got when we published uh, this information. And uh, the, the slope of the line would be close to unity if we'd increased a, a, included a change in length. Now, the other opposing group that's done this is Merrill Cohen's group from uh, Philadelphia. And what she did is she took and planimeted in the subcostal view the AV valve junction and divided the left and the right AV valve uh, into um, the two components, and uh, it showed that if this, uh, the, the left component over uh, the right component was greater than two-thirds, they could undergo a two-ventricle repair, but if it was smaller, they'd have to undergo a one-ventricle repair. And so that is a standard used uh, to look for um, the unbalanced canals that did uh, particularly poorly. So in conclusion, I think balance is a very complex issue. Treatment must be based on several factors, including morphology, physiology, philosophy, and surgical uh, preferences. And echo is only one of the many determinants. And in the end, the surgeon is uh, going to have to make that decision in the operating room. Now, lastly, when we talk about AV canal defects, we have to look at the post-operative assessment. And the post-operative assessment, the one overriding factor is not the repair of the AV septal defect, but repair of the left component of the AV valve, which determines how the uh, ventricles are going to do. And here you can see a patient with a fairly substantial degree of uh, mitral, or we call it left AV valve regurgitation, as well as because he's had a, um, a, an annuloplasty of the valve has got some component of stenosis. Here's another example again, and uh, we could call this a failure in the sense that uh, this uh, valve didn't last for a very long time after surgery and actually uh, the, this patient actually had to undergo a, um, an artificial valve in the superannular position uh, after surgery. And there's another example of the degree of AV valve regurgitation from a different perspective over here. So this is long axis view, this is left atrium and left ventricle and you can see uh, the massive insufficiency with the coanda effect directing the, the uh, uh, regurgitation towards the posterior left atrial wall. And then sometimes that the, the uh, clefts will break down, as you can see here, there's a residual cleft uh, over here. I don't even have to put color on. You can see the sutures in here. This is a sort of dehist, as sometimes happens with these patients. And uh, this patient had to undergo a prosthetic valve. Here was an attempted annuloplasty at another patient, um, and this patient uh, was uh, seen at a peripheral hospital, and the doctor told me that he could feel a thrill on the chest, a systolic thrill. We knew it was mitral insufficiency, and here came the patient with mitral insufficiency, and we repaired the, 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 we had to replace the valve. Uh, residual defects are not uncommon. Small uh, residual defects at the valvar level, uh, down at the apex where it's most difficult to place the patch, uh, 
uh, uh, can occur, and that also needs to be atten have attention paid to it. So in conclusion, it's a complicated issue, and I think that uh, Tudor Echo plays a very important role in defining um, the problems that are seen, and uh, having directed them in that direction, they can be uh, further investigated appropriately. Thank you. And now, take this. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to be showing um, demonstrations of uh, AV canal defect or AV septal defect or call it whatever we want, but, but that's what I'm going to be showing. Um, So the first thing I'm going to just show you is a, is a live uh, 3D echo of a cleft um, or a trifoliate left AV valve. So this is live imaging. And, um, and, and here you get this very clear sense of, um, of the depth of the image. Once again, remembering that this part of it is, um, is sort of, you know, if you, if you look at this one straight up like this, it sort of starts to look more and more like a, like a two-dimensional image, if you will, say something like that. Um, although this image is not exactly pushed all the way down towards the papillary muscles, we're really using this to, from parasternal short axis view, going slightly higher up and then angling down towards the ventricle. And, um, and when you do that, that's sort of what you get to see. You can still make this a little bit nicer looking by decreasing the compression and the gain and that kind of thing. But you get the, get the idea very quickly of the, uh, the mural leaflet, or the left lateral leaflet, if you will, uh, or the lateral leaflet. And then that's the superior, and those are, that's the inferior bridging leaflet with the caudal attachments right there. Um, so this is uh, looking at it from the conventional echocardiographer's view. Um, but the surgeon, uh, or the pathologist, let's just start with the pathologist's view. Pathologist's view is going to be looking at it from above downwards, like this. So the plane of the atrial septum would be over here. The left appendage comes out over there. And that's the left lateral leaflet. This is the superior bridging, and that's the inferior bridging leaflet. So trifoliate left AV valve. If you actually talk to a surgeon, surgeon, our surgeon will tell us that this is not the way that they see this heart. When they look at the heart, the patient's left side is actually pointing down. So we have to kind of rotate it to something like this. And that's how they would actually see this. So the left lateral leaflet would be there, superior, inferior bridging there, superior bridging there. That's, that's sort of the, the you know, surgeon's view, or maybe something more like, uh, like this, I suppose, something like that. So the left appendage is down here. The aorta would be up there. Oh, you don't see the mouse there. I'm sorry. Um, OK. So basically, left appendage is down here. Superior bridging leaflet is here. Inferior bridging is there. And that's the left lateral leaflet. So the concept is that when the surgeons look down on the heart, the, the patient's left side or the left lateral wall of the heart is the furthest away from them if they're looking down from the right side because the patient is, you know, turned on their side a little bit, the heart's rotated away, um, and so on. So this is how the surgeon uh, would end up seeing this uh, trifoliate left AV valve. Does that make sense? Yes. 
So if there was a surgeon here, they would probably vouch for, vouch for this being, uh, being their view. At least this is a view that our surgeon uh, prefers. Uh, the next thing I'm going to show you is, um, is um, actually I think what I'll do is I'll show you the normal apical four-chamber view and the way that the uh, aortic valve is normally wedged between the, the two AV valves. Let's start with that. Uh, and, then, and then we'll go to uh, the canal. So to show the AV valves on FAS, we have to do a different kind of cropping compared to what we did before. Before we were showing the septal structures. Now we're going to show the AV valve. So to do that, we have to cut off the free wall of the atrium and then cut off the, I'm sorry, cut off the top of the atrium and the top of the ventricles. And then we're going to tilt this image down like this. And then we're going to give back the, the front of this heart. We did this earlier. And what this shows you is something that looks like a skull. But that's the left AV, the right AV valve there. So that's a septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve. This is a normal heart. Plane of the atrial septum here, the mitral valve there, the aortic valve that is wedged between the two AV valves. That's the right atrial appendage, the mouth of the, the base of the right atrial appendage. Um, now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take out um, uh, take out a, a similar similar image of a, a, a complete canal or AV septal defect, and uh, this is the one that we had looked at earlier, but uh, just to sort of um, go over what this looks like by um, by 3D imaging. Once again, we're going to cut off the the roof of the heart and then the floor. And let's see what we can uh, make it look like. So we're going to cut off the, the top of this heart up to about there. And then we'll cut off the bottom. And we cut off the bottom, we're going to leave the crest of the ventricular septum in the view. Because that's going to be a landmark when we, when we look down. And here we go. So we'll look down onto the valve now. And we'll give back the back of the, the heart and the front of the heart. Something like that and like this. So now we're looking at the common AV valve from above. So this is the right atrial appendage over here. Oh, sorry again. <laughs> so the right atrium is over here. The left atrium is over there. This would be the plane of the atrial septum if there were one. The aortic valve is over here somewhere. It's like it's so far anterior, it's just about out of the plane. That blue line that you see there, you'll notice that you only see it. I'm going to slow this uh, heart rate down a little bit so that can understand things a little bit better. But basically, the so what do you think the blue thing is? It's a ventricular septum. You only see it when the ventricle, when the AV valve is open, right? You don't see it when the AV valve is closed. So it's a different kind of view of, uh, of the heart, but, uh, but nevertheless. So here you get a sense that, you know, that it's sort of equally committed to the two sides. And just by the way, you start to get a sense, especially as I start to tilt this image, you start to get a sense for how um, you know, this, how, um, how much the inferior bridging leaflet here, the middle scallop of the inferior bridging leaflet and the right scallop of the superior bridging leaflet prolapse up. You see how they become a lot more prominent during ventricular systole, those two parts compared to the rest of the valve. A very abnormal um, broccoli-like uh, uh, leaflets in terms of the way that they uh, prolapse. And then we can kind of look at the same thing from below. So now we have kind of turned the image. So we're looking at it from the apex up. And when we look at it from the apex up, we're looking at a big right lateral leaflet, smaller left lateral leaflet. Remember, we still left the ventricular septum in view. So that's still the ventricular septum. That's a pulmonary valve. So this is right-sided inflow and outflow. And that's the left side. So what about the left-sided outflow? Well, I think if you tilt this a little bit, you'll start to see it. It's in that, that general area there. That's the LV outflow tract there. <laughs> there. OK, so that's the left AV valve, and that's the left outflow tract. And that's the right side. Sorry, I keep finding my mouse here, and I'm very happy with it, but uh, it's causing some problems. <laughs> uh, and then I showed you earlier how to, how to look at the um, the septal structure. So we cut off the side, cut off this, this side, that side, 
turn the image around and um, and look at it from um, from from uh, right to left so this is the inferior bridging leaflet then the superior bridging leaflet and this is the scooped out crest of the ventricular septum so this gives you a sense for the for for how big and irregularly shaped uh, canal VSD can be you see so it's all of this is a VSD and notice how much it changes in size shape configuration during the cardiac cycle it's really quite you know quite uh, quite striking um, and here it is looking at the same thing from the um, from the left side okay so this is from the left side and this would be if we had the apex in view here which we don't in this acquisition then you would have had a sense for the inlet to outlet disproportion we don't have it in view this is a frequent problem with uh, with, with uh, pediatric acquisitions uh, that we don't get the anatomic apex in whether for 2D echo or for 3D echo uh, the adult uh, sonographers or adult cardiologists, adult sonographers tend to be very good at going all the way out to get the apex. But the degree to which the apex is cut off in the acquisition becomes quite clear with a 3D image. Let me put it that way. Okay. Um, so then the next, um, next, next one I'm going to show you is a subcostal short axis view. These are just some basic examples. There's nothing really, no, no rocket science in any of these. But just to give you uh, an idea of how much we can see more of the heart with, uh, with 3D imaging. So this is a subcostal short axis view, um, left lateral leaflet, superior bridging leaflet, inferior bridging leaflet, right lateral leaflet, uh, RV outflow tract, plane of the ventricular septum is over here. Okay. So um, if we tilt this image up, then we start looking up the barrel of the, down the barrel of the RV outflow tract. You see those things flipping over there? Here, those are pulmonary valve leaflets. So all of that is the pulmonary outflow tract or the RV outflow tract. And then I'm going to tilt this again, and you get a sense for the LV and the LV outflow tract over there. Okay. And then if we kind of come back to this, so there are, these are just these slight little moves that you have to make to appreciate perspective in the image because bottom line is that we still have a problem with the two-dimensional nature of the display. So because the display is a problem, we have to kind of move the image around a little bit to look at it from, from kind of from side to side. Okay. So, um, and then the other thing we'll do here is we'll kind of turn this image around and look at it from above downwards. So looking from the atrium down into the ventricle. So now this is the patient's right side. That's the left side. This is the plane of the atrial septum. This is the superior bridging leaflet. This is the inferior bridging. That's a la right lateral leaflet. Um, and there is a left lateral leaflet. So superior, inferior, left lateral, right lateral. A lot of dropout issues and things like that here with this, uh, with this uh, particular demonstration, but that is what, that is what happens. Uh, next one I'm going to show you is a, is a sort of a primum ASD or a partial yeah. canal. Um, so the first thing we'll do here is we'll cut off the, the um, just make it, make it into a two-dimensional image so you get a sense for the ASD over here and the, uh, the sort of absence of offset between the right and the left AV valves because it is, after all, a common AV junction. Now our goal here is, to, is going to be to look at the septal structures on fast. Now you'll notice that this is a challenge because the right side is volume loaded, so the septal curvature is kind of like this. So if we cut it off on the, on the, from the side, we may not really get an easy on fast demonstration of the septal structures, but we'll give it a shot anyway. Um, so we'll cut off the, the, the right side that way. And then for the left side, I'm going to bring in this plane and cut it off at, a, at an angle. All right. So here comes the plane to cut, it, cut this uh, septal structure, the, the free walls off at an angle, something like that. Uh, and then I'm going to turn this image around and then give back the back and the front of the heart, something like that. So now we're looking at this primum ASD on fast from the right side. We've cut off the free walls of the right ventricle. This is the ASD over here, superior leaflet, uh, superior bridging and inferior bridging leaflet. Now we're not seeing the lateral leaflets because we've cut away the septal structures. We're only looking at the bridging leaflets. And 
And once again, you get a sense for, for how the ASD is sort of the floor of the ASD consists of the and then how much that ASD changes in size, shape, and, and um, configuration, if you will, during the cardiac cycle. You can change, turn this around and look at it from the left side, and here you start to see, see, this, see the faint white sort of shadow here? So that's basically caudal attachments of the bridging leaflets to the crest of the ventricular septum. Bob Anderson has examples of this type of a lesion where once you cut these away, you can't even tell the difference between a, superior, between a complete and a partial canal because they all have the same kind of a hole in the middle over here. Um, and then where's the LV outflow tract? Well, the LV outflow tract is, is right there. So you have to angle a lot to be able to show the LV uh, outflow tract in these, uh, in these hearts. But you get the sense for, once again, the roof of the ASD and the floor of the ASD, the floor consisting of the uh, bridging leaflets. Uh, and then the, um, another one I'm going to show you now is, um, is an unbalanced, uh, I'm sorry, this is an unusual one. So this one is, um, this one has a primum ASD and a big um, uh, VSD and it has two AV valve orifices. So it's kind of a different kind of a heart. Once again, there's not really a whole lot extra we're going to see by 3D echo, but you're going to see the heart the way that it really is, as opposed to uh, trying to make it up in one's mind. Uh, this is almost like a common atrium over here, just some strand of atrial tissue, but you get the sense that this is a common AV junction and a VSD here, but two orifices. Um, and, um, and so to look at the septal structures on fast, again, we will cut off the side this way cut off that side, that way, turn the heart around and sort of give back the front, give back the back and now we're looking at the septal structures on fast from the right side. So what are we seeing here? So the first thing we're seeing here is we're seeing the, that strand of atrial septum over there. Atrial septum can drop out from an apical acquisition. That's true for 2D echo, and it is true for 3D echo as well. So I'm not going to say to you that this is a big ASD. But this is definitely a primum ASD over here, between this strand and the bridging leaflets over here. And this is the VSD, crest of the ventricular septum. All of that is VSD. And then when we look at this uh, image from the left side, uh, once again, you see the, pr the sort of the primum ASD up there and the canal VSD down there. And the same idea that you get this big old hole in the middle of the heart um, and the, you know, the idea is that you know, sort of the, where the fusion occurs between the septal structures uh, is what determines what the communication is going to be like. So in this heart, the communication is, um, is an atrial level communication and a ventricular level communication. But the separation of the two AV valve orifices has occurred. There's a bridge there between the two. So the surgeon doesn't need to do that. He, does, he just has to close this and close that. Or she has to just close the VSD and the ASD. And then, um, and then I'm going to show you an unbalanced um, defect, unbalanced canal. So here we are again. Um, so this is... Um, this is um, similar to the 2D images that, um, that Norman showed you. Um, atrial septum, ventricular septum, small LV, big right ventricle, common AV valve over here. One of the interesting things that you notice with, uh, with, uh, with uh, certainly that, that I kind of learned more with 3D than I had figured out by 2D, is that the, you know, the nature of the septal communications, the nature of sort of looking at the, the septum on fast, all that that really tells you is, is, um, is, is what, what, what the communications are at each level. It doesn't really tell you the rest of the, the, the picture. And the rest of the picture is very important because the rest of the picture consists of sort of figuring out, for example, what the, you know, what the um, uh, bridging leaflets are like, um, and the nature of uh, ventricular dominance uh, and so on. So I'm going to retain that crop there and then I'm going to bring it 
bring another one in over here because I want to show you the septal structures again in this uh, acquisition. So with this sort of 3D manipulation, one of the important things you have to do is you have to kind of know what you're trying to do with these. So for example, what I, you know, my goal here is to show you the, the septal structures. And so, so once again, the crescent of uh, atrial septum, the um, seen over here, the primum ASD over there, and the ventricular septal defect that is seen over here. So this is the inferior bridging and the superior bridging leaflet. This is the ventricular septum. By the way, there's a little muscular VSD down there. That's looking at it from the right side, and then this is looking at it from the left side. So once again, atrial septum, primum ASD, inferior bridging and superior bridging, and then this is the scooped out crest of the ventricular septum. All of that is a VSD. That's a little muscular VSD over there. Okay. And then the last um, thing that I have to show you is a TEE on a patient who had common atrium that, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, and, and had a, a cleft mitral valve and all of that that the surgeon had repaired. And then the kid came back to us with a fever and, um, you know, the flap, the, 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 the patch just looked kind of more mobile than, uh, than it should. It was a big fellow. He had been a late diagnosed, uh, uh, late diagnosed, AS, uh, um, late, late diagnosed uh, defect. But um, basically that's the atrial, that's the ASD patch over there. And when you look at it from the right side, you can see that the, the, it's only the front part of the patch that is attached. The rest of it is dehisced. This is all completely dehisced patch. It's just attached over there and over here. It's barely, 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 barely holding on. So if you want to look at this from above, then that's sort of what it would look like. So we're looking at the valve on, you know, the AV valves on fast, and we're seeing the, so that's a right AV valve, that's a left AV valve, and that's the patch over there. And if you wanted to look at the, um, the, the valve itself to figure out if the left AV valve is doing all right, you kind of cut away the, the, the uh, patch uh, to be able to see that. And the left AV valve actually looks, uh, looks okay. But um, that's just an example of, um, of the dehisced um, ASD patch. Now we're looking at it from the left side, so you can see it's barely holding on there flapping around freely over there, all right? So those are some examples of uh, 3D uh, imaging with uh, AVST. Thank you for your kindness, Dr. Silverman. <laughs> Especially realizing I'm the only thing that stands between uh, 40 people and dinner. Okay, so um, just like in uh, VSD, there ain't much on strain, velocities, function in AVSD. Uh, so I thought I'd take the opportunity to talk to you about the effect of uh, atrioventricular valve regurgitation on function. And you heard from the previous speakers that there might be a lot of associated problems before or after surgery, stenosis, regurgitation, aortic insufficiency, uh, um, and residual shunts, all of which will uh, increase volume loading uh, there can be uh, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction uh, as an afterload lesion with and perhaps aortic uh, arch narrowing in some cases. And then Dr. Rudolph told you about uh, increased pulmonary vascular uh, resistance. And out of all of these, I think uh, most of the previous speakers uh, emphasized the issue of left AV valve regurgitation as a residual lesion that over time can become worse uh, and worse. And uh, here you've seen this uh, before, 
but just another uh, example of uh, severe left AV valve regurgitation after repair, and there can also be significant right AV valve regurgitation. And so altogether, these lesions can create quite a problem in terms of uh, ventricular function. I'm going to skip the slide because I showed that to you uh, very uh, recently. Now, if you take, and, and this is adult work on mitral regurgitation, not in AVSD. So that's what I'm going to talk about, AVSD, and now focus on uh, mitral regurgitation. Work from Anna Marciniak. RV is the regurgitant volume. If you increase the regurgitant volume, your ventricular dimensions, end diastolic and end systolic, almost in a linear fashion, go up. Uh, this group divided the regurgitation just based on their cutoffs into mild, moderate, and severe. So the worse your regurgitation, the larger your ventricles. Remember that I told you in one of the previous um, talks that the ventricle to cope with an increased load, an increased volume, will do two things, and it will do it at the same time. It increases its volume to handle that extra stroke volume, and it increases its contractility. But the price that the ventricle pays for that is an increase in wall stress. And eventually, as the dilatation increases because the valve regurgitation worsens, that increased wall stress will lead to myocardial injury, fibrosis, uh, and then a reduction in ventricular function. So if you just look at, uh, you take these groups, the control, mild, moderate, and severe, and you just look at displacement and at velocity, the velocity start uh, to change uh, a bit in the uh, uh, severe group, displacement didn't change much. If you look at the tissue velocities among the groups, you can see that there really isn't a strong correlation between the velocities. And remember what I told you before, between the change in volume and the change in ventricular size having opposing effects. But what I want you to see over here is that in the severe group, because this is where you are most nervous about ventricular dysfunction developing, in the severe groups, there's quite a scatter of the velocities. If you look at strain, really only the group that shows a decrease in strain is in the severe group. That's where it becomes apparent. Now think about this. Uh, if you, I showed you this before and I said I'd come back to it, and this is where I want to come back to it. If you increase your uh, diameter, for an increase in contractility, you can increase your stroke volume. Conversely, if you keep your strain rate the same and you increase diameter, you need less strain. So if you have mitral regurgitation and you have uh, a fixed volume, for a, you go, when you see a decrease in strain, that would imply a decrease in contractility. And that's when you're scared of getting ventricular dysfunction. Now, because of the opposing effects of the ventricular size and the stroke volume, I brought up the question before in ASDs, should we correct for ventricular size? Here is strain in those same groups when you don't correct for ventricular size. And you do get a correlation here. But if you look carefully at this, you can see that the correlation isn't determined by the mild and moderate groups. The correlation, in fact, is determined by reduced strain in some of the patients with severe regurgitation. Some have decreased strain, some have normal strain. Who has decreased strain because they have reduced contractility, and who has decreased strain because their ventricular volumes have enlarged? That's the problem we want to figure out. If you then correct your, your strain for the ventricular volume, you can see that the line of regression tightens up quite a bit. And now, a lot of these patients where before you weren't sure what was going on, in this series at least, uh, they have reduced strain. And this shaded area is just based on uh, a certain standard deviation or based on their control data. So these patients, you would assume, have uh, reduced uh, contractility. And put differently, the same data, if you... Uh, correct the strain for the ventricular size, you see you get rid of a lot of these patients in terms of cutoffs for surgery, and you then are able to differentiate the severe group better. The red circles here are based on the 
previous or uh, at the time of the paper, the European Heart Association guidelines for surgery when the end systolic diameter was above four and a half and the American guidelines at that time were four. And so these are the patients uh, who would have gone uh, for surgery. And Dr. Rudolph or someone asked me before, well, can we use strain then to predict the function after surgery? So you send those patients for surgery and you send patients with reduced ejection fraction for surgery, who's going to normalize their function after surgery? And you could ask the same for AVSD. Well, earlier work would suggest that the ventricular volume is indeed quite a good measure to look at or to predict the response or the uh, function after surgery. But I brought this paper because especially important in this paper was the end systolic volume indexed for body surface area during exercise. We don't exercise our patients very commonly to predict response. Maybe we should start. This is older data because the reserve of the ventricle during exercise is often quite predictive. Uh, and this, uh, you can see the correlation with post-operative ejection fraction, which most uh, papers use as their definition of normal function post-op at a year or whatever it is. Now, the same group who I showed you their work in terms of correction for ventricular size in showing who has decreased function went on to try and predict using these measures who will normalize their function after surgery, or who will remain with dysfunction. And they took a group of adults with uh, mitral regurgitation, uh, and they divided them into two groups, those that had post-op uh, ejection fraction more than 50% at 12 months, that's the usual outcome, and those with less, group two. And they further divided group two into those that had a normal ejection fraction before surgery, but reduced ejection fraction after surgery, and a group that had reduced ejection fraction before surgery and after surgery, so-called group 2B. And uh, you can see uh, their parameters over here. By definition, uh, this group had reduced uh, EF before, uh, but you can see uh, the stroke volumes uh, are really uh, increased uh, in, 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 the, in all groups. Now, if you look at ejection fraction and you go by these groups over here, you can see that group one uh, really had a normal ejection fraction and it remained normal in the year after surgery. Group 2B, who had reduced ejection fraction before surgery, never normalized their ejection fraction at any time. But the real question or the group that we wouldn't be able to resolve is this group. They started with a normal ejection fraction and decreased their ejection fraction after surgery, this group were dependent on their volume loading when, it, when in a sense the volume loading was masking their ventricular dysfunction. So how are we going to differentiate between these two groups to predict who's going to have a uh, bad function after surgery? And this is where deformation imaging has become useful because this is preoperative regional strain and strain rate a po uh, correlated with post-operative at a year ejection fraction. And you can see that there's a relationship even though there's quite a bit of scatter, obviously, and this is uncorrected. Now, if you correct then the strain for uh, volume, you can quite nicely differentiate between group one and group two in that uh, these never normalize. They are abnormal before surgery and remain abnormal. So you can get a pretty good uh, differentiation between the groups. And other um, uh, uh, investigators now are using global longitudinal strain, which is the average strain of all the left ventricular segments or of six uh, ventricular segments in the longitudinal. And I've just brought one paper, but there, there are a few papers out there to predict uh, recovery of ejection fraction. And this is before and after surgery. The volumes go down. Ejection fraction also goes down. We're looking for those that go down to here. Uh, and if you just take ejection fraction and uh, dimensions, which is what the current guidelines really use, it is predictive in multivariate analysis. But you can improve that prediction, and predominantly in those patients where ventricular dysfunction was masked before by adding uh, strain on.
So strain imaging here has become useful. This was particularly interesting because this is Bavaria beer, but as far as I can understand, it comes from Holland. So just to, it's a bit confusing. Thank you.